participants i request all the participants to please mute yourself shortly we will begin with the technical session day two technical session all governance regulation and uh, security in cyberspace am i audible wasia yeah yes anita you are audible prala sir good evening sir I request all the participant to kindly mute their mic. I think a resource person has joined, Dr. Mala.
शोभा मैडम अनितम यस मैडम शुड वी बिगिन रिसोर्स पर्सन हैज जॉइंट लेट अस मेक हर को होस्ट सो दैट इट बिकम्स इजी या गुड इवनिंग मैम माला मैम गुड इवनिंग No, no. I need to make her co-host. I need to know no. her name. You know, uh, where she's logged in. One second. Otherwise, she will not be able to unmute herself. Mala, ma'am, you can unmute yourself now. is she the co-host is mala madam the co-host ah mala sharma i i got i Yeah, I did yeah. manage to unmute myself. Can you hear me? Yes, madam. You, we can hear you. Oh, great. Uh, good evening to all the participants. I welcome everyone uh, to the second day of this uh, international faculty development program. I hand over the session to Dr. Vasiha for this. Good evening, everybody. It is a great privilege and pleasure to welcome you all to the second day's session. of international fdp on ethical social and uh, issues in cyberspace it gives me uh, am i audible yes okay. at the outset i express a heartfelt welcome to our resource person dr mala sharma ma'am uh dr mala sharma ma'am is a seasoned legal professional with extensive corporate commercial law and commercial dispute resolution expertise she recently has joined london south bank university where she will be leading modules of contract law and international sale of goods dr sharma has completed her phd research on international investment arbitration on full scholarship provided by the faculty of arts and social sciences University of Surrey United Kingdom previously Dr Sharma attended advanced academic qualification that includes two master degrees in LLM uh, LLM from London of School of Economics masters in business law degree from National Law School of Indian uh, University Bengaluru for which she was awarded PK Das Memorial Gold Medal for securing the highest marks in her cohort with a career spanning over a decade Dr Sharma has grown through various roles in both private practice as well as academia while providing bespoke legal advices leading dispute resolution processes and teaching university students Dr Sharma has held associateship with two London based law firms and was a principal associate with Nanawati Nanawati Advocates Ahmedabad India prior to starting her PhD she now possesses a well developed skills and knowledge in negotiation legal drafting and presentation and dispute resolution coupled with exceptional proficiency for building and maintaining strong working relationship with clients colleagues industry and stakeholders in the past dr sharma held academic positions at united world school of law gandhinagar jp law college guwahati national law university assam dr sharma also has built a prominent profile of academic articles published across reputed international journals including chinese journal of global governance ma'am is a blend of corporate and academia so i think uh, ma'am has also an expertise on transnational dispute resolution and she has published a paper on tra in transnational dispute resolution journal journal of international obotsum association she is currently working on a paper accepted for publication in the journal of world trade and investment on investors state arbitration and climatic change 
Mala Ma'am has been a speaker at several international conferences held in China and UK. In today's session, Ma'am is going to put uh, throw a light on governance of cyberspace, which is also informed by her legal practice experience of dealing with online frauds and counter frauds bodies in UK and India. Ma'am, on behalf of Government Ram Narayan Jalaram College of Commerce and Management, uh, on behalf of our principal, on behalf of our, the whole organizing team and IQSC, I welcome you to this session, ma'am. Welcome yeah. you, ma'am. I welcome so our beloved principal, sir, Dr. B. Chandrasekara, sir, who has been a guiding light and a supporting pillar behind organizing this FDP. Welcome you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. I welcome Pralat, sir, uh, the IQSC coordinator. And who has been uh, our continuous support and has been motivating us to organize these kind of programs. Pralat, sir, welcome you to this program session, sir. I welcome the organizing secretary, uh, Dr. Shobha, to this session. And I also welcome all the participants who have logged in from various parts of the world to this session. I hope this session is going to be very informative and also knowledgeable for us. Thank you. And I hand over the session to Mala Sharma, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pridos. It's, it's lovely to be able to present this session here today. And thank you for the warm welcome and the introduction. I have prepared a few slides, and I think uh, it would make things easy if I can just share them. Ma'am, we have made you co-host, ma'am, so you can share yeah. the screen. Uh, I hope you're able to see it. Yes, madam, we can see. Yeah, yeah. we can see it. Okay, so my presentation today is on uh, governance, regulation, and security in cyberspace. And uh, let me just get on with it. Well, in 2015, I won't go very back in time, but in the just the past couple of years, and uh, just half a dozen years ago, this is 2015, Ukraine's power grid uh, faced an attack, a, a cyber attack, on which left half of the homes at a particular region in Ukraine without power for a few hours. In 2017, we had the WannaCry ransomware cyber attack in which around 200,000 computers were affected in more than 150 countries. And this outbreak had a massive impact across several different industries costing billions. Closer to home, we had the Cosmos Bank cyber attack in 2018 where around 14 crores were transferred to a Hong Kong bank compromising the SWIFT system. And around 80 crores was withdrawn from ATMs uh, because of a, through the payment gateways rather, of Visa and Rupee debit cards that we use. And as if COVID-19 wasn't enough, uh, we had in 2021, the Rock U, which was basically the largest website compilation leak uh, which uh, of around 4 point, uh, sorry, 8.4 billion entries. So is it kind of an apocalypse to think of yourself facing all of these, either in sequence or all of them together? So imagine sitting in a dark room or almost dark room, if it's late at night, with a message popping on your computer, hopefully you would have power back up on your computer, that states that your files, documents, photos cannot be recovered unless you pay someone sitting across in some random part of the world. Simultaneously, you get a message on your phone, which is on low battery, that states that money has been withdrawn from your bank account at a random place, and you are unable to log on to your social media because someone somewhere has changed your password. That would probably be a doomsday. Well, not as dramatic as that, but something similar happened, or rather I faced a cyber attack, or rather Air India faced a cyber attack in which my data was compromised. And on the 30th of May, I got this email from Air India stating that the 
The CETA PPS, their data processor of their passenger service system, had recently been subjected to a cybersecurity attack, leading to personal data leak of certain passengers, including mine. And the email very conveniently states, this incident affected around 4.5 million data subjects in the world. I don't know if they refer to data subjects as information about their passengers or if they refer to it the, to the passengers themselves. So whatever, irrespective of what it, the data subjects here in the email refers to, looks like it was quite a big attack. So where does this all leave us? Well, I hope in today's session, we can deliver, or at least I can deliver uh, the fact that at least by the end of the session, you'll be able to appreciate the pervasiveness of cyber attacks and give you an understanding of the legal framework of cyber regulation in India, because I'm a lawyer. And of course, this is a faculty development program. So we will think about ways of how you can include cybersecurity in your curriculum. Now, even before we get started, what do we really mean by cyberspace? Um, is, it, is it a space of how we think of it as a country, for example, uh, like India? So to make a state or a country of India, you would require four elements. That is the people of India, the territory of India, the government, and the government's sovereign power to do what it wants to do within the territory. That's a classic definition of a state, of a space. So can we think of the cyberspace as a space of some sorts where people are the netizens, the, the citizens are the netizens. The territory is not exactly located at a physical space, but rather at a virtual space. And can we say that governance is primarily democratic, where the sovereignty is shared by the netizens themselves. Or we could think about the internet, the space, as something being devoid of laws or governance. Well, that was actually the vision of the first cyberpunks who kind of promoted this idea of digital anarchy that was free, from, free of rules and where humans could just prosper away from the eyes of uh, the government, free from censorship and control. One way of conceptualizing cyberspace as a place could also mean that it is a place for criminals to sell their services and illegal wares on the dark web. Alternatively, we can think of the cyberspace as a medium, i.e. A, a tool used by technology and social media companies to monitor, store, and sell our data. For, and this can also be used by the government. India's three main surveillance projects, the NatGrade, CMS, and Netra, have been directed to stop collecting data by the Delhi High Court. So what do you think is cyberspace? That is my first question to you. And I think uh, we can get to discussing this of what is cyberspace as we go along, hopefully towards the conclusion of this session. So, but that's something I want you to keep in mind and think about. Then, I like to conceptualize it as a place, probably because of the free thinker that I am. I think of it as a space that needs to be regulated. Regulated because I don't want the state to regulate, to over-regulate it, but I also think that this space requires regulation for several different reasons. One, I think that a lot of wrong things happen online. Particularly if you look at the mental health of uh, content moderators, that will tell you the kind of things that go on the internet. So for example, content moderators of the videos that you, you, that you watched on YouTube or even uh, or, or Facebook, the, the people who are moderating the content that has been posted, they have really high rates of depression. And some of them even suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder after watching the videos that they see that are being uploaded that is eventually kept away from you, obviously, because of the content regulation. So a lot of wrong things happen. Again, this entire space uh, is being used in such sophisticated manners that traditional laws sometimes are not really enough. There is also the problem of deep fakes, and we will come to that as I, as I go along. We'll, we'll see Tom Cruise and his deep fake. 
And again, this space also has a lot of misinformation and disinformation. Again, it is required to be regulated for protecting privacy. And this is, again, something that I want you to think about. And we can take this up towards the end of the session of why do you think this space, if you, if you conceptualize it as a space, why do you think it needs to be regulated? Or if you think of it as a medium, why that needs to be regulated? Well, the European Union has published, a, I mean, it published a paper a long time ago. This was sometime in 1996 where it pointed out around eight different reasons of why this particular cyberspace needs to be regulated. They cited reasons of national security, that instructions on bomb making, illegal drug production, terrorist activities, information on all of this is so easily available on the net. Secondly, for protection of minors, there are abusive forms of marketing, violence, pornography, a huge problem. And again, we will, we will see uh, this as we go along. It is also important to regulate internet for protection of human dignity. So you don't want uh, hate speech being promoted. You don't want incitement of racial hatred or racial discrimination. And closer to us, to most of us, I guess, is also economic security for those of us who use online banking. Fraud instructions on pirating credit cards of how you could do that. It was all available on this dark, gloomy, not gloomy, well, dark place of internet. And of course, there is the problem with information security of malicious hacking. Again, you don't want unauthorized communication of personal data or electronic harassment, right? And it is important to regulate all of this for protection of reputation and, of course, intellectual property. So the EU gives all of these different reasons of why we need to regulate internet. Again, as we go along, I want you to think what are your reasons? Why do you think the space or this medium needs to be regulated? So I was talking about deep fakes. Sometime between February and June this year, uh, you might have seen this in TikTok. It went viral on TikTok, which, uh, well, you might not have because I think TikTok is banned in India. But you may have come across this in newspaper reports, or if you haven't, here it is for you for the first time. But in this year, it featured uh, an artificial intelligence generated doppelganger who was meant to look and sound like Tom Cruise. So we see Tom Cruise flipping coin, chewing, um, getting very excited about finding a chewing gum inside a lollipop. But this was an artistic creation of an artist. And But I want you to think about what can happen or what do you think is happening when you are able to create these deep fakes of political leaders and make these artificial intelligence generated doppelgangers say whatever you want them to say. What do you think will be the implications if a political leader makes some statements hurting sentiments of a religious minority, for example? What do you think is going to happen? So it, it, it's, it's a very sensitive and a very, very dangerous uh, area, but you see how uh, technology can be used to do all of these different things. Again, there is this whole problem of misinformation and disinformation. Misinformation is when you unintentionally say something untrue, whereas disinformation is where I, you are actually propagating something that is untrue as a propaganda. So this, uh, the picture that you see here on the screen is that of a so-called restaurant in uh, the shed at Dulwich. Now, I think I need to just increase my volume. Is it audible now? Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, yes Malana, yeah, okay, it's great. audible. Okay, great. So this uh, picture that you see on the screen is that of the shed at Dulwich. This was actually an experiment by a journalist. What he did was he created this fake restaurant and he put it up on trip advisors, asked his friends to write raving reviews about this place. It was so good that it landed up being the best restaurant in London without even existing. So the journalist takes it further. He actually invites people over for a night, for, for dinner, and he creates this atmosphere in, I think it was his studio or the rented place that he was living in, 
where we are serving people microwave food and people actually when they left they said that they really enjoyed the place and the ambiance and the uniqueness of the place etc cetera, etc cetera. and this will give you an idea of what you can really do in the internet how much of misinformation and how much of this information can you put in and this website actually exists of course i don't think he's taking reservations anymore so you can't really go and there is absolutely no point spending so much money to eat microwave food but this is something that you should look at i think there is also an entire documentary done on this particular thing and it's it's very interesting to watch it at least tells you how this internet can be a very very strange place and of course we had the cambridge analytica scandal right and one of the facebook users very famously said you are the product on the internet it is you whose data they are selling and this as some of you may know was uh, all about how elections were being affected by data mining companies including cambridge analytica so where does all of this leave us is it all really gloom doom are we heading towards some sort of a doomsday in the cyberspace well no there have been proposals and this has been it, it's a very current topic and it's 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 very very extensively discussed and the discussion usually starts with professor lawrence lessig's framework of how do you really regulate this space professor lessig's framework uh, comprises of four different elements he says that this entire cyberspace could be regulated in, with reference to four different elements one is the market of the internet one is the architecture of the internet the norms and the law so he places a lot of emphasis on the architecture which is basically the code uh, he says that is the best way to regulate the internet but today this presentation is all about the fourth element which is the law the state regulation Professor Lessig, he criticized uh, the belief that the internet is some sort of a sovereign entity without ties to the traditional legal system. And he said so because it could lead to the demise of free speech and privacy. And to, it was important to maintain these values uh, on internet. And he described these four methods of regulating therefore. And uh, today what i am going to really talk about is the law part the state regulation so how does the state really regulate this space and and this is more specific to the indian setup though i will be referring to some international uh, work that has been done so when we think about the state when we think about the law we see the state exercising power through three different branches of the government of the state right so that's the legislature as we know it the parliament the state assemblies then there is the executive i.e the vice president the president the prime minister the cabinet of minister the law enforcement authorities of uh, the ias the, the bureaucracy and the police and then we have the judiciary which which is all about the lawyers and the judges right so we will see how the internet is regulated by all of these three things or at least in places where they're not regulated this how these different uh, bodies of the government uh, have have tried to intervene so we will see how the police deals with uh, criminal uh, cyber crime cases but even before we get into the indian uh, regulation part of things i also want you to think about what are you exactly regulating and what is it that you want to protect so for us from the perspective of state regulation if you are the government if you are the state what are you going to regulate mark zuckerberg very famously in a washington post he, he, he wrote an article where he proposed regulating uh the internet the content of what that is available on the internet and specifically he, he said that four different areas should be regulated one was harmful content Second was anything to do with election integrity, privacy, and data portability, data mining. So he, he said that these are the four areas that the state needs to focus in terms of regulation. But in the UK, we have the House of Lords Select Committee, which recommended 10 principles to guide the development of online regulation. And if you uh, see this, if this is more about, these are basically 10 principles. So the first one being that 
the parity, the equality, i.e. the level of protection that is afforded to individuals online should also be available offline. The second principle is that of accountability, that processes must be in place to ensure that individuals and organizations are held to account for their actions and policies. The third, fourth, and fifth principle relate to transparency, openness, and privacy. So how much are these powerful businesses and organizations who are operating in this digital world, they should be, they should be open to scrutiny, and the internet must remain open to innovation and competition. And individual, the privacy of individuals have to be protected. Within the EU, we had the GDPR regulations come in a few years ago, and that has really, really uh, enhanced privacy. So now when from the UK or from most European countries, when you access the internet, you get a message on your phone, allow cookies. Cookies are basically trackers, right? They're tracking what you are doing. So you can disallow, you can reject all the cookies and it seeks your permission in the, whenever they're tracking you basically or collecting your information. So that has, that's a huge step ahead in terms of protecting privacy on the internet, at least within the EU. And of course, there is a ethical design that services must act in the interest of the users in the society and vulnerable categories of people, including children, must be protected. I mean, giving a free reign to internet, giving a free reign to everyone on the internet would just, would just spiral things out of control in terms of child pornography and pornography in general, but more specifically child pornography. And of course, there is the need to respect uh, human rights and equality. So you want to control hate speech. You, want, you don't want people to be spewing out racial hatred online. So that's one reason to, that can guide uh, the regulation of this space. And of course, you need it for, you need to promote awareness and uh, accountability, proportionality and evidence-based approach whenever the state is thinking in terms of regulation. So, but how is India really dealing with this? And as we go along, do try to think about what do you think should be the priorities of, uh, and how, how do you operationalize all of these different principles? Just, just think about it, and we will discuss it in the, in the question and answer round, hopefully. So when you think about the first limb of uh, the, that, that I discussed, which is the legislation, the lawmaking power of the state, in India, we have the IT Act of 2000, which is the Information Technology Act of 2000, right? And the major objective of uh, this act is to deliver and facilitate lawful electronic, digital, and online transactions and mitigate cyber crimes. Now, this particular legislation or law is based on the uh, UNCTRAL model law on electronic commerce. UNCTRAL is the United Nations Commission on international trade law. It's a body that uh, so many times formulates model law on so many different things. So for example, in India, India's arbitration law is also based on UNCTRAL model law. So our IT Act is also based on the model law uh, provided by the UNCTRAL. And a lot of other countries have also used that model law. Now this act, this, this particular legislation, uh, provides legal recognition for transactions carried out by way of electronic uh, data inter interchange, what we refer to as electronic commerce. And uh, it's, uh, of course, applies to methods of communication and storage of information uh, and filing of electronic documents with government agencies. The Act also amends certain other legislation, and we will be uh, looking at the Indian Penal, some of the provisions of the Indian Penal Code as we go along. So the Act also amends provisions of the Indian Penal Code in the Indian Evidence Act, Bankers Book Evidence Act, and the Reserve Bank of India Act. So the way IT Act wants to regulate the cyberspace is also by way of creating offenses, by creating these cyber crimes. So the three main cyber crimes as found in section 65, 66, and 67 is firstly, it prohibits tampering with computer source documents. And if you do so, that crime is punishable with imprisonment up to three years or with a fine, which may extend up to two uh, lakh rupees or both, i.e. you can be imprisoned and you can be fined. Section 66 deals with hacking with computer system. 
This is punished with imprisonment for up to three years or fine, which may extend up to two lakh, and or you could just get both. The last, or not exactly the last, well, 67, because we have uh, quite a few subsections that we will discuss. Uh, section 67 deals with publishing of information which is obscene in electronic form. And for this particular offense, so this basically deals with pornography, this has a graduated uh, system of punishment. So for the first time that a person is convicted, uh, you are imprisoned uh, for five years and one lakh of uh, fine. For the second and subsequent convictions, you can be imprisoned for almost 10 years and the fine is two lakh rupees. In addition to these three, there is, there is punishment prescribed for several other uh, related crimes, all of which are covered between 66A through 66F, and of course, there is 67A and 67B. In a case law of Shreya Singhal and Union of India, the provisions of section, or rather section 66A was struck off as being unconstitutional. So that no longer applies, but we still have punishments prescribed for dishonesty receiving stolen computer resource or communication device. We have punishments for identity theft. You have punishment for cheating by personation by using computer resource. There is punishment for violation of privacy, punishment for cyber terrorism, punishment for publishing or transmitting of uh, material uh, containing sexually explicit act or in an electronic form. And you have punishment for publishing or transmitting of material depicting children in sexually explicit act, i.e. child pornography. Just, uh, I, just one second, I think I... Okay. I think there is a problem with my hearing. If you just give me a moment, I think I should just turn off my fan and just, just give me like two seconds, literally, yeah? Because I think it's the fan that is because I've increased my volume to the highest level it can go, but I think it's the fan that's creating a little bit of an issue. Just, just give me one moment. Is it better now? Yes, ma'am. You can continue. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you. Sorry about that. So uh, all of these punishments are prescribed. And we also have, as I mentioned, the Indian Penal Code. The IT Act kind of amends the Indian Penal Code. But some of the provisions of the Penal Code can also be read with uh, the IT Act. In cases where the IT Act kind of conflicts with any other law, it has overriding effect. So the IT Act takes precedence. But some of the sections of the penal code that applies to uh, even cyber crimes would include the sale of obscene books, voyeurism, i.e. using of a camera to do things that you shouldn't be doing, i.e. photographing people uh, in a private act, uh, be it while using a restroom, changing clothes, et cetera, et cetera. There are pro provisions for dealing with stalking, which in the uh, Indian Penal Code, uh, which is also which also could be used for cyber crimes. Again, there is punishment for theft, for dishonestly receiving stolen property, cheating by personation, for forgery, for defamation. All of these are also covered uh, by the Indian Penal Code as well as the IT Act. Now, to just give you a flavor of things, this is a screenshot of photomorphing cases. So we tend to think that if it doesn't happen to us, it probably doesn't happen that often. But just while I was doing research for this particular presentation, you will be surprised to know just in the month of August, just in this one newspaper, there were eight different reports of photomorphing cases. So I, I hope that helps you appreciate the, the scale at which cyber crimes happen. Similarly, this was uh, in one of the cities, uh, in, in Nagpur, where 38 cases were registered, 30 arrests were made for child pornography in the last eight months, not even, so you can imagine how rampant, how rampant cyber crimes are. And of course, so along with uh, the IT Act and the Indian Penal Code, uh, regulating all of the crimes, 
We also have certain other I rules made under the IT Act. These are kind of secondary instruments. Uh, for example, the latest one is the Information Technology Intermediary Guidelines and Digital Media Ethics Code, uh, which was just released a few months ago uh, by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology. Now, this particularly applies to social media companies, Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp, and there have been a few cases currently pending in the court as to the applicability of the rules, et cetera, and what they really require uh, uh, these social media, these big giants to do. But um, I don't know how in which directions the judgments are going to go. We will see that. But I want you to also appreciate that the crimes as such are regulated by the Act, the Indian Penal Code, but also the internet is regulated in terms of regulating these really big companies or even smaller companies providing services over the internet with other kind of rules. So, and this is a very interesting uh, set of rules and you might want to explore this uh, in a bit more detail. So what are the main challenges that you would face in regulating? I guess it's just internet is so broad to speak, right? This this massive space this huge medium, which comprises of so many different layers and levels, such as network infrastructure, protocol standards. And on top of that, it's the user services built on it, right? So how do you, in regulating all of this, maintain the right balance between ensuring the free flow of information that we get today and guaranteeing the protection of public interest, i.e. saving children, not promoting racial hatred. So that is again something that I want you to think about. So that's the legislation part of things. Now come to think of the enforcement of these things. How does the enforcement uh, really happen? Well, you go to the police, something wrong happens, a crime happens, you go to the police, right? That's the usual thing you do. You go to the police station, you register a written complaint at the cyber cell of the city, and there you need to provide some of your information, your name, your contact details, your address, etc. And if it doesn't, if the police station or the, that department doesn't really have a dedicated cyber cell, you register a cyber crime FIR in the local police station. You can also insist on registering a zero FIR in which a police officer cannot deny the registration uh, of a zero FIR, even if that offense is committed outside the police station's jurisdiction. So usually, uh, if a crime happens, you would report it to the police station of a particular jurisdiction, right? So for zero FIRs, you don't need that. You just report it to any police station, and then they kind of internally transfer it to the relevant uh, police station if, or, or they have to basically act. So that is something that you can make use of. Now, uh, if, so some of the cities in India, they do have uh, cyber, a dedicated cyber cell. So this is again a screenshot from the cyber cell of Delhi police. And you will see that along the, it, it gives you the information that you need to provide while making a complaint. So if, if your complaint is email related, you will have to provide a written complaint explaining the complete incidence of what exactly happened. You have to provide a copy of the alleged email uh you know the full header of the email so that the sender at the time uh is known by them and of course for social media related complaints there are a set of other things that you need to provide for example a screenshot of the url or the soft copy could be given in as a cd rom for business related uh email compromise complaints again the list is a bit bit, bit longer in data theft Again, they have a separate list of uh, information or documents that you need to provide. And it's worthwhile if you're interested, just go to their website and see. There are quite a few. I've just copied like uh, two screenshots, but there are quite, the list is pretty long. But of course, if they try and cover as many different things that they probably can think of. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. In Karnataka, well, it was one of the first states in India to set up a cyber crime investigation cell. Oh, I love Karnataka. So. I'm really proud of this. Uh, again, if you might want to visit the Cyber Police uh, Bangalore uh, website, it, it's a fairly, it's, it's a good website. And I managed to, again, take a few screenshots of the forms and the information that they need when you're making a complaint. 
unlike uh, Delhi police, where they have provided you a long list of documents that you need to provide in different kinds of uh, crimes. Here, you would, uh, they kind of divide the form into financial and non-financial. So for financial complaints, you just have to provide, of course, your name and your age, address, your contact details, and of course, the beneficiary into which you put the money. And then, of course, provide a description of the incident and how you were victimized, which was basically the facts of the case in brief. And, but for uh, the form is a bit different for non-financial crime. So if it is a case of identity theft or information or tampering of computer resources, WhatsApp image, video morphing, email hacking, obscene sexually explicit content, child pornography or others, you just stick it and you explain it. The forms, the other information on both this financial and non-financial are kind of similar except, except this bit. Now that was about law enforcement, right? So how about uh, the judiciary? How do you, how, how does the judicial wing of the state? So we, we, we discussed how legislation works, we discussed how law enforcement or the police works, and then at last we come to the judiciary. Now this is a massive, massive field because there are so many different kinds of uh, cases that are uh, covered by within uh, by the judiciary. So I'm not going to go into a lot of cases, but I have provided the link and I'll be sharing my slides. Uh, so you can have a look. Uh, there is a, a fairly uh, easy article written by uh, uh, Mr. Talwan Singh, who's the additional district and sessions judge of Delhi. And it, it, it's a very interesting paper. It, it explains the cases very in a very simple language. So even if you're not a lawyer, you can have a look at those cases. They can make such good script for movies, and I'm not kidding you here. So again, the Indian judiciary, also the Supreme Court, has ruled on the constitutionality of some of the provisions of the IT Act, and we saw how 66A was struck down in the case of Shreya Singhal. Another area that is currently being discussed here is the need for cyber courts in India. Do we need specialized courts in India to uh, do you think it would be useful? Uh, in terms of really, really real specialized courts dealing with these kinds of crimes because they're increasingly becoming so sophisticated. So is there a need to train judges to really take cognizance of the intricacies that go on in cyber crimes? That's, the, that's something that's open to debate. And again, we can discuss this as we go along. But what does all of this mean for our faculty development program? Well, it just means, I guess, three things. One, you want to stay safe yourself. You, you want your students to stay safe. So if I've provided the links here, and if you just visit the website of the Bangalore Cyber Police, uh, you'll see that there are do's and don'ts for both teachers and students. And some of it, uh, you can really, really hone it to your students to you know, follow these guidelines. The second way in which we can uh, deal with these kind of cyber crimes and increase awareness of cyber security is when we are teaching as teachers, uh, whether you're teaching a banking subject or contracts or you're teaching hotel management, you can always make use of examples of cyber crimes, which is very specific to your discipline. So you could think about ways of incorporating these examples. And thirdly, you can also encourage training for your students, or if you are interested, you can ju just have a look. I have uh, provided some of the links for some of the free courses. You don't have to pay anything. This is all open access. You can, if you want to get a certificate, I think for edX, for a few courses on edX, you have to pay. But to do the course itself, just to become aware, it, these are incredibly good uh, places. There is a course by Washington University on introduction uh, to cybersecurity that's available for free. You have uh, Politecnica Valencia, again, which is on cybersecurity and social implications. You have another by uh, MIT, which is on cybersecurity for critical urban infrastructure. So I'm sure you can make use of one of these uh, courses and, you know, encourage your students to kind of have a look at them and maybe even you can have a look yourself. So the summary of this presentation is this, that cyber crimes are rampant. 
there are regulations in place, but cyber crimes are increasingly becoming very, very sophisticated. How a state decides to regulate this internet, this network of network, it all depends on how you conceptualize it. Do you think of it as a place? Do you think of it as a medium? Or do you think of it as something else completely? And we can discuss this. In India, we have the legislation, the IT Act of 2000, which is good, but not really good enough because it is more focused on e-commerce than on crimes. It does describe a few crimes, but I don't know if that's enough. Then, of course, some cities have dedicated cyber cells uh, in their police departments, but others are not that advanced, in which case you can just, if, if you ever happen, un, if you ever unfortunately have to face that kind of situation, you just go to your local police station. And of course, the Indian judiciary, which has been fairly open minded, but there is this whole discussion about whether we need cyber courts and if judges require more training. As teachers, uh, you know, stay safe, keep your students safe, and of course, research and teach about such crimes in our respective disciplines and subjects. And of course, we can encourage our students uh, to uh, provide the list of all the courses, uh, some of the courses, sorry, at least access some of them and gain some more knowledge in the field. With that, I would say stay online, stay safe, and thank you. I shall guess open the floor to questions. Yeah, ma'am, how are you there? Uh, yes, Anita, madam, I'm here. The participants are uh, here now can ask any queries or questions what they have uh, in, in be related to the session. Dear participants, uh, you can ask any question related to the session. You can also post it in the chat. Vintage, sir. Vintage, sir, you had a question. No, two participants have raised their hands. Uh, please unmute them. Shobha. Shobha, madam. Yeah, yeah, I'm there. Yeah, two participants have let raised me, their hands. Please let me know the name so that I can unmute them. Yeah, once. Hello. Hello. Uh, good evening, madam. Good evening, sir. Yeah, it would be nice uh, uh, if you can on your camera also, sir. Yeah. Camera. Uh, okay, ma'am. So I'd like to ask a question to ma'am. Yes, sir. Yeah, go you are on. audible, sir. You can continue. Yeah. Yeah, daily um, or many times we get a <clears throat> like uh, uh, messages like uh, you click on this link, you'll get this prize or uh, you'll get this offer, job, something like that. Many, every day, almost every day we get this kind of fake messages and all. Mm -hmm. So like uh, how we can ban these kind of uh, fake messages or avoid this kind of messages? So is there any... Yeah, you could, uh, there are, the, I think a service provider must be providing a disabled, all these kind of messages. So you have a provision to disable them from your end. And of course, uh, in some, I think even in Bangalore, you do have, a, I, I think I saw that on the, on the website of the cyber police, where you can just report those kind of numbers. So I guess when, I, it all depends on the numbers. I think when a lot of people start doing it, eventually they'll block it off. You can also, on your phone, you have the choice, at least on some phones, you do have the choice of blocking them on the phone, even without uh, approaching your service provider. So I guess these are the three ways in which you could deal with the problem. Uh, Nita, ma'am? Yes. Nita, ma'am? I request you to on your camera. Yes. I yes, introduce yes. yourself and then ask the question. Yes. It would be very nice. Good evening. I'm Good Dr. Evening. Nita Mathur. From the state of Rajasthan, I work at uh, the government college at a place called Nasirabad. I teach English. 
my question is that more and more now we are dependent on the internet particularly the school children because their education is being you know so called transmitted through this medium but uh, uh, quite often when you have both parents away from home and the children are expected to attend to their classes through zoom classrooms etc how does one ensure that the child uh, is not going to other avenues through the mm. internet and mm. is only staying in the classroom how does one that ensure that is it uh, uh, there is there some uh, mechanism in uh, place yeah i think there are parental controls uh, which i think sometimes are available on your network system or sometimes even on your computer that the child is using so you can make use of these parental control i'm not uh, very good with the software part of things so i can't really okay. tell you exactly what to do but i guess if you just uh, look up parental controls on the model of computer that you have that might just give you the steps of how you can enable and disable certain uh, sites or um, and i think that's it, it, it's actually a very interesting question because it raises so many uh, it like they say it takes like the entire tribe to raise a child right so i guess not just parents i think even the school somewhere because of covid i think that has this has become even more evident where we need to come up with a system where if they are joining the class they are just joining the class i don't yes. know how they will create this kind of an infrastructure but i think that is what is eventually required because it it would otherwise become very difficult to con control everything and also another thing of not having a setup like that is opening yourself up to cyber attacks because children usually you know even if you get some warning or some sort of a flashy thing on your screen they if they just click on it they will they 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 can cause a lot of damage so mm. i mean here in the uk there have been instances where children have paid for uh, paid using their the credit card information that was already mm. stored onto the computer they've bought things for themselves costing mm. like thousands of pounds without mm. even parents knowing so i mm. guess for for children particularly to keep internet uh, and this whole medium safe for children a lot needs to be done and it, it's a very interesting question and this is something which i think even requires further research and i'm sure there something must be on i don't really know what exactly is on but i'm sure there there should be some research mm -hmm. on ongoing on this but of course you can look up parental controls for the computer that you have i think that will resolve some of the issues okay thank you so much thank you thank you ma'am thank you neeta ma now i uh, abhishek swami shri abhishek swami has raised the hand yes good evening so if you can on the camera and uh, introduce yourself and then ask the questions abhishek sir am i audible to you Wasiya, ma'am. I think we can ask another participants. By the time no, Abhishek, he is not uh, able to. I'm, yeah, now I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm able to mute my, uh, unmute myself. Yeah. A very good evening. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mala, for the session. I wanted to ask you: Is the IT Act of India good enough? And is it good enough for the uh, safeguarding the interest of the citizens of uh, Indian citizens? And what else can be done? yeah thank you again a very interesting question particularly because i'm a lawyer i think the it act is not enough really it is because it is based on the ancestral model law it is primarily to kind of safeguard electronic e-commerce i don't know if it is a it does criminalize a few things but is that enough to just protect the internet i'm not sure regarding the second part of your question of what can be done i think this is a question which has to be addressed at different levels the internet is a huge place it's it's a it's a strange huge network of network and i don't know if just legislation or governmental action is enough i think the onus is on us as uh, individuals living in a society to do to to really take care so if you see and we can do this in so many different ways for example you see a wrong comment on twitter report it don't 
be shy or don't think like it doesn't concern me or that comment is not directed to me. I think a lot of things can, could be done with collective effort. And that is one of the things also Lawrence Lessig talks about, like social norms. And of course, we can have a more uh, stringent coding within it. So of, as I explained, the four different things on uh, Professor Lawrence Lessig's model, we have to use all of those four things to really, really regulate this place. But in terms of the law itself, it, it's, it's, it's good, but I don't know if it's enough. I hope that answers your question. Any other questions? There's one more question, ma'am. Uh, uh, when we talk about data mining, usually yeah. when we go to any malls, our data, we share it for some or other reason. Uh, mm -hmm. That time the data gets stolen by other companies and we get lots of calls mm -hmm. and some are fraud. So mm -hmm. when we talk about legality as a co consumer, uh, mm -hmm. how will law protect us from our being our personal data being stolen because mobile email IDs are our personal data. Mm -hmm. But somehow through data mining, many of the MNCs are using this data. Mm -hmm. At one level, it is also up to us to be careful of how much information we give out. And if something wrong is happening, A, it is our responsibility to report it, right? So you could report it if it is something, if, if, it's, if it's some sort of a harassment, you would report it to the police. But if it's like constant barrage of marketing emails, you might want to write to the relevant company and say that this is happening. And in fact, uh, when you talk about information and passwords, et cetera, it, it not only in, it just doesn't happen when we go to say shopping malls. It's actually, it's, it, again, the question is so important because it happens so often. So we have the case of uh, Arif Azim versus Union of India where a call center employee uh, took the details, the credit card details of a person resident in the US and used the Sony Sambandh website. By, basically, Sony Sambandh is a website by which NRIs can send gifts to India, to, to their uh, family and friends in India. So he used that website and uh, used the details that he got during his job to order himself a pair of, I think, headphones and a TV television set or something like that. So a lot of these things happen. And of course, the person got away pretty lenient because he was young and it was, he was a first time offender. N nothing much happened, but it, it's a very critical issue. And I don't really have an exact answer of how you can uh, stop this. But yes, if it is harassment, you go to the police. And if it's something marketing related, you would approach uh, the respective companies, but also we have to be very vigilant. We have to be very, very uh, alert that these things don't happen to us. That even if someone's sending us these links and messages and uh, things, like in, in the first question that was asked, I think you know you can sometimes block the sender, but if it keeps happening repeatedly, that is something you might want to take up with the police. Malam, we have a question from uh, Miss Gayatri M. She asks how to protect our emails from email hackers. Well, I, I don't really have uh, the technical expertise in terms of, you know, the coding of the email, et cetera, et cetera. But I would suggest that you change your password frequently. Keep difficult passwords. So don't keep your name, your birthdays, something that people know about you, for example, your workplace, et cetera, something that's, that's, that you can. And, keep very specific uh, security questions. And one of the things that you can do is kind of download a double authenticator. I don't know if, uh, uh, if but it looks something like this. And I mean, I, I say this because my university was uh, uh, subject to a cyber attack. And even after that, we had this, you, you can do it even for Gmail because I, I know I did it. It looks something like this, it's, it's like an, Authenticator like that. I don't know if you can see it's, 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 it's something like that. Sorry, the light is really bad. But if you just uh, go onto your app store or uh, I don't know about Android, but I'm sure just 
look up Outlook Authenticator or Email Authenticator. There, what they require is once you kind of put your password in, uh, they will ask you for another code. And that code kind of changes every 30 seconds or so. So you can't have, uh, like you can't, you, I, I don't know if the light is good really, but it, it's like a one-time password code. It keeps changing. I have that for my Gmail, so I know that it's safe. But in terms of what else can you do within your email settings, I think that is a question for the professionals. There's a very interesting comment. Uh, it says something like, everybody is telling, be careful about cybercrime, but nobody is giving any authentic way to protect. Why? Well, because it's a very, very complicated place. And no matter how much we try and give you these general ways of uh, protecting yourself, be careful is always one of the advices that you have to follow. Because you, you just never know from which side or in what way you will be attacked. So one fine morning you wake up and you see a ransomware saying, all your files have been encrypted, now pay us in Bitcoins or else we will not let you release your file. It, it could have come from anywhere. I mean, some random person sitting somewhere would have orchestrated this whole thing to attack, not just you, but a lot of other people. So it becomes very difficult to give uh, very specific advice that you do this. So the best way, Till we get to a point where the regulations are incredibly efficient, enforcement is incredibly efficient, we just have to be careful. I have another question for Dr. Mala, if I'll be allowed. May I? Yes, sir. Yes, uh, my look? name is Abhishek Swami. I'm from Assam, from Guwahati. Uh, Dr. Mala, I have another question. What yeah. do you uh, I do you think transactions, financial transactions through cryptocurrencies are safe, and should they be regulated? Cryptocurrency currently is not regulated in India. Do you think it should be regulated and made well, part of the financial system of India? Well, I'm not very futuristic, and to be honest, I don't really have the requisite knowledge to comment on the subject. But the way bitcoins are growing and the way people are investing in them, I think in the time to come, they will be a normal feature of our society. And it could be that transactions online, I mean, in the, I don't know, 50, even 50 years, I'm thinking, thinking it's way too far. Maybe in 20 years down the line, it will be like the currency of the internet. We don't know. So should it be regulated? Oh yes, I'm all for regulation all the time because I, 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 I don't want to sound too negative, but I don't trust the human mind. It, 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 it's a very, very uh, fickle instrument that we have. So. And as much as we believe in human goodness and kindness and sweetness and all that goes with it as a lawyer and because of my training, I am kind of cautious. So yes, I am all for regulation. How to regulate, I do not know, um, but it is something I hope to know in the future in terms of will it become a, a feature that is extensively used? I think yes. Thank you so much. Hello. Gautam Karat, sir. Your question, please. Ma'am, may I? Yes, yes, please. May I? Hello. Hello, yes, Good sir. Yes, sir. Good Hello. evening, Maya, ma'am. Myself, Dr. S.S. Rathod. I'm from Jodhpur, Rajasthan. Ma'am, can I ask a question that uh, the uh, right to privacy vested in Article 21 or 19 of Indian Constitution, is it time to redefine the right of uh, privacy vested in... Uh, Article 21 of Indian Constitution. But because I think we live in the era of uh, uh, cyber world and especially my concern to the data privacy. Mm. I think, uh, you know, the I Constitution think, of India, I think yeah. it's one of the most wonderful documents in the world. And it is fairly broadly worded. But I think in terms of, so I don't necessarily think that the Constitution needs to be amended. But I do think that we have to be cognizant of the fact that Privacy has these different facets, particularly when we talk about privacy on, in cyberspace. So I think, uh, and I think there are some regulations in place already. What we could do is have very, very specific 
legislation on privacy within the cyberspace. So if that means regulating these big social media companies, regulating uh, other pro service providers, I think that is a better way to go around because when you just, I mean, you could, but why would you change the constitution, for example? I mean, it, it would be something very overarching. Whereas if you have a more specific legislation on privacy, it is much easier to make people accountable. So you know who will be made accountable. So for example, in the new intermediary guidelines that have come up in February uh, this year, and which became, I think, effective from May this year, uh, a lot of companies are now required to have a person called the grievance redressal officer. And I think it's a, it's, it's, it's an incredibly, uh, well, not incredibly, it's a good thing, provided it, it, it kind of uh, pans out the way it should pan out. But of course, there are challenges uh, that have been mounted against those rules, and we will see what the courts eventually say. But I think a better way would not just be, it, it's not really a constitutional law problem. I think it's more of a privacy law problem, if that answers your question. There is a question. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Hello, ma'am. Can you listen to me? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, we are you are audible. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my name is Gautam Karat from Maharashtra, and uh, my question is, uh, what is mean by ethical hacking? Could you explain, ma'am? Ethical hacking. Uh, well, it is uh, as far as I understand, it's a. Uh, Actually, I've had a friend who did an entire course on that. Ethical hacking is where you are kind of hacking for something good, I guess. I don't know if it is morally correct, uh, which technically makes it unethical, but it is, as far as my understanding goes, it, it is something, sorry, I just got distracted by a question. Yeah, it is something that you would do because the outcome or the end result of that hacking isn't necessarily bad a lot of it is used by journalists and i think there are courses on ethical hacking if you are interested okay thank you ma'am there is a question from samina banu is google pay and phone pay good to use regularly uh again i am a law person so i will not be able to comment on the uh, effectiveness of the payment mechanisms that are used in these platforms. So I'm, I'm terribly sorry about it. I don't think I'm the best person to answer this question. If there is someone within the, the within the cohort that we have today, I think there are 209 participants. And if someone is a software engineer or someone with a technical background, might just be in a better position to answer this question about, again, if the online payment systems are safe. I guess companies have to, by law, put in some safeguards, but I just don't know how effective they are. Thank you. So. As uh, Dr. Francis, sir, has raised the hand. Sir, would you like to ask the question? Francis, Dr. Francis, sir. Yeah, it would be nice if you can on the camera also, sir. Dr. Francis, we are not able to hear from you. Mala, ma'am, uh, we'll wait for a few seconds. Maybe yeah, yeah, internet no problem. problem. Two minutes, we'll wait. Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. In meantime, any other participants want to ask a question? Yeah, I think uh, we have done with the questions. 
now i request professor tina cherry madam to propose vote of thanks Hi. for this session mm -hmm. tina cherry ma'am yes am i audible uh, yes uh, tina you are audible good evening to all uh, so on tina behalf... sorry to interrupt there is one more question okay, in the fine. chat box uh, mala yeah. can we take how does government gives justice if we get cheated in cyber world uh well i guess the government is responsible for creating these laws at the end if someone is violating your right hold on the question just disappeared from my end for some reason yes it's there uh, uh the government has created this framework right there is the legislation there are the police and of course if you have a specific grievance against a specific person you would approach the court how does it give justice i think it's the job of the court to do justice and not i mean the government has to make just laws but eventually if it is that one person who specifically gets cheated by a specific person it is up to that person to take it directly with that with the person the victim it is between the victim and the perpetrator of the crime in that case you would take the help of police or if it's some sort of a if the dispute is more of a civil nature you would take it to the court so i guess in terms of getting justice you are more reliant on the court system and the police then the legislative wing of the state if that makes sense thank you malam yeah i think uh, some people have just asked for my contact details so i will just uh, provide you my contact detail on the chat please feel free to leave any feedback or anything uh, if you want to be Oh, sorry i think it went as a direct message sorry sorry i should have done everyone here uh, so this is my email id if you have any questions that is law related or you think i should be able to answer please feel free to let me know yeah i guess yeah thank you i mean if there is any other question i am i'm done from my end Uh, there is one more question uh, dr mala yeah can you take up yeah if someone hacks into one mail id use the credential then send some message against against the state what okay this is interesting what protection does account holder get mm against the state well the state is responsible for protecting itself i mean the state has huge resources for itself it has the entire Um, you know this i'm assuming that the state is a fairly rich entity that can take care of its of uh, its own interests so i wouldn't be worried uh, as to what the state uh, could do really but if it is you for example if someone hacks into your email id and uses that credential what you could do well uh, there is a case law actually and this is uh this is tamil nadu versus i can't remember the the name of the respondent but in that case something very similar happened where uh, a lady got a divorce and then her ex lover kind of pursued her again and to which she said no not her ex lover sorry someone who was interested in marrying her or something to that effect and then she again said no to this guy and this guy creates some fake accounts or like keeps sending messages to all of these uh, random people which obviously affects her integrity and uh, other case uh, the, the court found against her so if 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 there is a problem of some of this nature you could of course approach the court but i think for if they do something against the state it is for the state to take care of itself really uh, thank you dr mala and uh, aza sir dr aza ahmed khan any more questions now i hand over the session to tina cherry ma'am 
Tina, ma'am. Now I hope all the doubts got cleared. Yeah. Good evening to all. On behalf of Government RC College, Bangalore, I take this opportunity to thank Dr. Mala Sharma, ma'am, for today's session on governance, regulations, and security in cyberspace. This topic is of great relevance in the present scenario. And Dr. Mala, ma'am, has provided us with valuable insights on the legal provisions relating to cyber crimes, the procedure as to how to file complaint, and also, ma'am, has patiently clarified all our doubts. It was the session was highly informative, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I would like to thank our beloved principal, Dr. B. Chandrasekharan, sir, for his support to the International Faculty Development Program. Also, I would like to thank Dr. Prahla Choudhury, sir, IQAC coordinator, for all the support extended to this program. Also, I thank Dr. Satish, sir, IQAC co-coordinator, Professor Lakshman Kulgot, sir, HOD, Commerce Department. I would like to thank all the participants of this FDP. Also, I thank Organizing Secretary, Dr. Shobha, ma'am, and also the team members for organizing this FDP. Thank you. Kindly post uh, that, uh, kindly fill the, the feedback form which is posted. Thank you. Thank you, Malo, ma'am. It was a very informative session. Thank you. Yeah. Th thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. And I thank all the participants for being a patient listeners. Thank you. And uh, Mala, once again, on behalf of organizing team,